Hello and welcome to the latest webinar in the Elemental Talks program and happy Earth Day, everybody. Our topic today, day and night, the effect of lighting design on health and well-being. It's the second of two Elemental Talks this week on light and lighting. The first broadcast yesterday on energy efficiency and carbon will be available on demand very shortly in case you missed it. I'm your chair for the next 60 minutes. My name's Jim McClellan, founder and editor of SUSMeme, home to both the magazine and the top 500 rankings. Joining me on the panel this afternoon are John Mardeljevic, Professor of Building Daylight Modeling at Loughborough University, Jonathan Rush, Partner, Lighting Design at Hall Lee, and Diana Chilella, Designer and Director of Drawing Room Interiors. Welcome all. It is all live with Q&A to finish. So pop your questions, audience. You should see a little Q&A box at the bottom or side of your screen. Type your questions in there. You pose them, I'll ask them, they'll answer them is the idea. So this webinar, I'll give you a bit about Elemental, forms part of the programme hosted by them, www.elementalexpo.com. It's the online community for professionals focused on innovation in heat, water, air and energy, the vital elements within the built environment now and in the future. You'll find a full diary of events on the website, range of upcoming webinars. There's a back catalogue. You can view a whole host of hot topics, all available on demand who's who are great speakers and I hasten to add all free to access. There's also some in-depth interviews to watch, longer form articles on the Pulse, including one I penned recently for them uh, on robots at work beneath our feet. So lots of infotainment for you to enjoy on screen. So today, by way of a very brief intro from me before we get to our panel. So day and night, light and lighting, everybody, all of us will have experienced the wrong kind of lighting at some point too bright, too dark, making space less relaxing, conversely sleep inducing, prompting concerns about eye strain, headaches, all of the above. And as well as our physical comfort and condition, lighting can also impact upon our mental health and well-being. There's growing awareness of the importance of daylight for our circadian rhythms. With insufficient exposure, typically during winter or maybe shift working patterns, leading to people finding their sleep disrupted, perhaps experiencing social jet lag, as it's called, or seasonal affective disorder, SAD, SAD. Along with other indoor climate and environment factors, such as air quality and temperature control, also, of course, lighting can be key to improving performance in, say, education and workspaces. So the range of psychological and cognitive behaviours from impacts and the attention spans of children, for instance, through to the efficiency of office workers can all see a difference. So today we're going to explore how light and lighting can create more user friendly environments for work and play. We'll debate the priorities for more people centric and sustainable design specification, plus look at the latest innovations in products, systems and technology all together, taken together to optimize health and well-being. So our panel, as we start to explore the relationship between light and lighting, health and well-being, I'd like to begin by asking each of you to introduce yourselves, explain your perspective and share a few opening insights. So it's briefly, who are you? Where do you fit into the puzzle? What's the state of play right now with light, lighting, health and well-being? So first, placing our discussion in the context of daylighting, John. Hey, um, my background is in physics. My first sort of lighting simulation was simulating the light from distant galaxies. That was nearly 30 years ago, I think. And coming from that into buildings, it astonished me that, that daylight in buildings was assessed under this single overcast sky. So having spent a number of years trying to find out what was happening with the light from gas swirling around at the furthest reaches of the universe, I thought maybe we should try and do a better job here on Earth. And I ended up largely off my own back developing and validating the technique which became known as climate-based daylight modelling. So this was predicting daylight in absolute terms using realistic sun and sky conditions. So it was really about the sort of the means of of predicting you know, reasonably realistically the, 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 the true variability of daylight. And that's really become a platform for a whole swathe of, of research, but also for um, evaluation of buildings. Now, for a long time, this was something that was the preserve of research um, and that maybe high-end practitioners. 
but it became mainstream, I think, in 2013, when the Education Funding Agency made it a mandatory requirement for the evaluation of all new school designs. So they clearly thought daylight was important, but the existing measures weren't delivering good designs. So thank you. So from galactic beginnings, <laughs> if you like, to building design, um, that's a, obviously that's a straight career path we all recognise. And Jonathan, as an expert in innovative and creative lighting solutions, where do you see the state of play at present? I've got to try and beat John's uh, galactic sort of <laughs> start, haven't I? So hello, everyone. And um, yeah, thanks ever so much for having me. I'm Jonathan Rush. Um, I'm a partner in Hawley. Hawley are uh, really quite a large multidisciplinary building services consultancy. We're 159 years old, so we've been around for a while. We do all sorts of things, MEP, uh, mechanical, electrical, public health, sustainability, fire engineering, AUV, acoustics and lighting. Um, and I'm a lighting designer. So I've been doing lighting design for 20 odd years. I run the lighting design team. As a team, we put people first, brackets and planet, because obviously you can't really think about uh, people without thinking about the planet and our ecology and biodiversity. Um, and I should add, we also, we design with light. So, you know, we sort of take into account the daylight side of it, as well as the artificial light inside of it, because buildings, as John was quite rightly saying, are not static, they change. Our experience of them changes throughout the day. Um, I am one of very few people, uh, surprisingly, in a global market of $160 billion, apparently, uh, that actually gets paid to sort of do tell people what to do with light. Um, it's surprising that it's, I might've made up the $160 billion thing, by the way, <laughs> just so you know. But I, I, you know, the point is, is that there's very few professionals out there that really sit and actually talk about light as a specialist exclusively. Um, so I'm kind of like, kind of like the dentist of light, although I didn't think I'd be saying that when I started talking. Um, so uh, yeah, so I've got a master's in lighting. Um, uh, I'm a fellow of the of SIBSI Society of Light and Lighting. And, you know, light is really vital to me. Um, I think in terms of the state of play and where things are at in terms of health and well-being, I, there's amazing energy. I think young people are really engaged in it. I think uh, even, I'm going to mention it, before the pandemic, people were quite mm -hmm. engaged in health and well-being and, and, and mental health and, and all of these aspects. But I think that's really escalated um, right now. And I think it's, it's really up to everyone to keep up with that. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, a dentist of light. I think you should have that on your business card and email. We can scrap that bit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and Diana is uh, an interior designer and an award winning specialist in healthcare. Hi. Hello. First of all, I'd like to thank you, Jim, for inviting me on the panel today. As Jim says, I'm an interior designer and I specialize in healthcare design. I'm the director and founder of the Drawing Room Interiors, which I launched in 1989. We design for the healthcare industry, mainly designing care homes, retirement and extra care facilities. I'm also associate consultant of Hammond Care, Dementia Choices and an associate lecturer at Books New University. In healthcare design, light is paramount to the well-being of our residents, patients, staff and visitors. We use what's known as evidence-based design to design using methods which are proven to improve the life of residents, giving them more independence, confidence, less accidents, and lighting plays an extremely large part in this. Changes in the eye means that the capacity to see steadily deteriorates from a young age. By the time people are about 75 years old, they need twice as much light as a normal standards recommend. Some people affected by dementia can have difficulty even processing um, visual signals. And it's therefore really important that we need at least twice the, norm, the amount of normal, what we call normal light in care, in care settings. In fact, Stirling University and Hammond Care both recommend lux levels of over 300 for dementia enabling environments. It's important to remember that reflection and contrast are key to vision. Glare from light for an aging eye is not good. Uniformity of light is so important. Any changes in lights from different areas, so if you're walking from one room to another, can be very difficult for an aging eye because they are react slower than, than, than perhaps a younger eye. A good way, and I'm sure uh, John's gonna agree with this, a good way of delivering 
light is used of daylight. It's both free and gives an excellent color rendition. We recommend in healthcare avoiding blocking daylight as much as possible with blinds and using curtains that really come off the windows. Because well-planned lighting can help people with dementia and impaired vision. See where they're going, identify space, rooms, equipment, signs. It helps them see other people's faces and body language to have the confidence to actually join in recreational activities and everyday routine. Poor lighting will substantially reduce a person's ability to do all these things. It can contribute to accidents, particularly falls, and cause unnecessary stress. For some people, the correct levels of lighting can be the difference between dependence and independence. Thank you. Really interesting stuff there, Dara, thank you. And, and then in the middle section of this, uh, some good issues already in play, but in this middle section, I'd actually like to get into some of the challenges and the conflicts. I'm going to try and have a chew at some of the difficult stuff. So zoom in on some specifics and really talk to our panel about why we're not always getting the balance right when it comes to end user experience. Whatever the metrics of success might be, performance, comfort, recuperation, aesthetics, why are some light and lighting environments ultimately bad for our health and well-being? So what's the problem? Innovation, cost, culture, skills, standards, and what needs to change or accelerate to benefit this health and well-being? So Jonathan, starting with you, throwing down the gauntlet, is there a, a shortage of affordable innovation on the market from lighting product and system manufacturers, or is it more the designers, the engineers, the consultants who lack the expertise in creativity? Who's to blame is what I'm asking. Blame's a strong word, isn't it? Um, <laughs> uh, so affordability, I think is an issue, um, but I'll get to that in a minute. I think, I think we've got all the tech, we've got all the equipment, we've got all the gadgets and gizmos. I think we might even have too many gadgets and gizmos. Um, there's definitely a lack of definitive research that will tell people exactly how much light you need. I think that's a, a complex one. Now, John will tell me and Diana, Diana will probably jump in as obviously daylight, daylight, daylight. Absolutely. Great away. You know, we can't match those levels with artificial light or we could, but it would be ludicrous to do so because it's too bright. So, um, you know, it, the question often, often is, is can you can you support a healthy circadian rhythm in, uh, entrainment in some ways with artificial light? And it's always lacked that kind of definitive that says this is how much you need. Um, there is great research coming out now, you know, there are more definitives coming out. And I think that's really going to help people know what we what to do. But I think in in the vacuum that that's created, a lot of people have jumped to gadgets and gizmos and complexity and tech and all of these things, you know, um, in terms of light that changes color and everything like that. Um, uh, you know, as lighting designers, we've been banging on for ages about how you can create good quality environments without having to do a lot. It doesn't have to be complex. And um, I think if you look at this, you know, start the day with some good light, good daylight, preferably nice bright light, keep it in the, you know, blue spectrum. If you can't get good daylight, I will argue that, you know, sometimes daylight is a bit of a luxury for some people. I mean, it's not always yeah. something that people can get, but, it, you know, try and get good bright light during the day. And as you move into evening, make sure that that doesn't, you don't keep bright light, you know, soften it, lower it, ease yourself into sleep and then sleep in the dark. Really simple. That's quite, you know, that should be quite a simple thing. If, if I'm honest, the real problem is, is that, it's how we treat light, how we perceive light in the building industry, not from me, not from the people on this panel, I'm sure, but you know, we see light as a utility. It's a bit like gas and electric. It goes into a building, it just sits there, it just happens. Very rarely do people see it as being designed. I think, you know, if people knew how vital it was for our sleep and for our development, for our kids, for our eyes, for our ocular health, for productivity, or however you look at it, you know, it would become more important. Um, we still pay more for our flooring, I believe. And I'm, I like floors, you know, I love a good parquet. Um, you know, I'm not saying we have to pay less for our floors. We might have to just invest a little bit more in our lighting because it's so important. Um, you know, I think what will happen and, and, and it comes to this is we need to change that perception. Light needs to be seen to be more important in people's life in terms of their 
general exposure over 24 hours, their diet, as it were. Once that starts changing and people start demanding it, the money will be there. You know, it was just it's it's just a perception thing that we need to change. Excellent. Nice points. And I think we'll come back to some of those about value, perception and priorities. And coming to you then, Diana, as uh, an interior designer. So for sure, parts of healthcare might be developing a more detailed understanding of the importance of light and lighting, much as you described earlier. But looking at the wider interiors market, my challenge is, is it just failing its clients by ignoring impacts on health and well-being? Do we need a cultural shift? Absolutely, Jim. In some cases, the effect of light on health and well-being is being ignored. We need to be a more inclusive society. We have to accept mm -hmm. that the age and I requires higher levels of lighting, less glare, more uniformity, and where possible, maximum daylight. Most healthcare facilities now understand this and follow evidence-based design. However, people with impaired vision, dementia, and aging eyes do not only use healthcare facilities. We should be embracing this information across all commercial spaces. For example, retail, airports, service stations, hotels. Good design should be inclusive design. If we take dementia as an example, over 850,000 people are living with dementia in the UK. That's one in 14 people over the age of 65 have dementia and the condition affects one in six people over 80. Yeah. So design needs to enable these people to live well in their community, enable them to continue doing the everyday things that we take for granted, such as going shopping or going to the bank. Inclusive design doesn't need to be compromised design. It shouldn't be obvious. Done correctly, people shouldn't realise that we're even using evidence-based design. We're an ageing society. There are nearly 12 million people aged 65 and above in the UK, of which 5.4 million are aged 75 plus. Statistics and projections produced by the Office of National Statistics indicate that in 50 years time, there's likely to be an additional 8.6 people aged 65 years and over. That's a population roughly the size of London. Therefore, we need to be looking at the basic principles we're using in healthcare design and how this can improve the wellness of the general population. For example, if we look at retail, if we think of like a retail display unit and how much reflected glare there is there, could we not avoid that? Perhaps use matte finishes instead of gloss. As well as looking at the lighting levels, though, we also, and it consistently, we also need to look at like reflectancy values, LRV, of our finishes. For example, if we're looking at floor transitions, if I was designing, say, um, had a carpet in a bedroom and then a vinyl in a bathroom, or I had a corridor that led onto a lounge that was in a different coloured carpet, I need to ensure that my LRVs are less than 10. And this enables people to navigate easier. If the difference was more than 10, to some people, this, the difference will appear like a hole or a step. So that's when they're hesitant to walk and worried to, to, to walk alone. If we look at LRV difference between, say, a floor and a chair seat, for example, we would always try and do a 30 LRV difference so that a person can see the seat, giving them independence and confidence. Because if you're not sure exactly where the seat is, you're going to be really worried about sitting down because you might miss the chair. So you're going to need somebody to aid you. If you can see it clearly, it gives you more independence. And that's just a small example. Cooler light, including daylight, is likely to be perceived as brighter. Aging eyes tend to have yellowing lenses. Therefore, the ability to see in cooler range diminishes. Using more cool light can help the ability for older eyes to distinguish colour. Most important, use of daylight wherever possible. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. And some of that reminds me of, I did some work um, with a, a major retailer who um, had a, and have a, a very famous plan with one letter in the name, which might give you a clue, but um, they did quite a lot of interesting work about designing their stores, obviously for older um, shoppers and consumers. And some of it was obvious in terms of access and doorways and more seating and things like that. So, but some of it was, and, and also at the tills, and, but then they were looking again at navigation and, uh, the visual aspects and the, once they started looking through the whole range in terms of what was an aging demographic in many cases of their clientele it's very interesting how that was potentially 
changing not just the design of new stores, but impacting the retrofit of older. So um, yeah. yeah, lots yeah. lots of uh, questions and lots of learning, and they were embracing that very positively, I have to say. So from that then, John, in, in the last of these, throw the gauntlet down. And I do remind viewers as well, pop your questions in the q and I've already got a couple on Twitter as well. So John, coming to you, do we need to just stop wasting time and money on elaborate lighting solutions and sensor rich bling to solve avoidable problems and start investing in better modeling and design for daylighting instead? In other words, we just got our priorities wrong. Uh, yes and no. I mean, we can't just rely on daylight because the sun will go down and we'll have to stop work at three o'clock in winter. Maybe that's not such a bad Sounds all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, it's, it's, it's maybe worth just, just going back to look what happened with the BSF, remember Building Schools for the Future mm -hmm. program. Okay, so that was, uh, that, that started off in the first decade of the millennium, 35 billion program, and then 80% of the designs were massively slated by a whole range of, of commentators, including CABE, the Commission for Architecture of the Built Environment. And what was going wrong was that the, the message of good daylight was coming across, especially from studies that were carried out, say, by the Heshong Mahone Group in California of Im improved academic achievement in students in well daylight. But because we only had this overcast sky design paradigm, people took better daylight to just mean higher daylight factors. Mm -hmm. And so you ended up with overglazed schools. And if you recall, we, you know, students fainting in classrooms in these newly built schools in Bradford, you know, which is hardly on the equator, uh, because the message got across, but it was being poorly implemented. So with daylight, if we want lots of daylight, we're inevitably going to need lots of glazing and some means of controlling it. It's only with a sort of highly articulated architectural form can the fixed form do a reasonably good job of tempering Yep. that luminous environment mm -hmm. yeah. and you do see examples of this throughout history good intuitive daylight design but when you've got highly glazed structures without much in the way of articulation then you have some way of, you know you need some way of controlling the daylight mm -hmm. if you've got manually operated internal blinds they will come down and they will stay down and we've seen that all over the place. They'll stay down sometimes for days. Yeah. Um, automated blinds, they're certainly better, but the heat has still got in once it's got through the glass. So, um, I mean, one of the technologies that's been promoted as the sort of the holy grail of the fenestration industry is dynamically variable uh, transmission glazing. Mm -hmm. Leader is probably electrochromic. So this will vary its transmission dynamically but you can still see through it, even when it's down to 1% visual transmittance, which you need very low. So that brings in another thing here. You can't separate the benefit of daylight from the benefit of views. And one of the neat things about, certainly about electrochromic is, it preserves that view outside, even when it's heavily tinted. Interesting, that's a nice point, because I know we've had Oliver Heath, for instance, on Biophilia on one of our panels earlier, more actually about air quality and uh, natural ventilation and natural light. But uh, again, so yeah, some of the same principles applying for sure. So thank you very much. So we've looked at some of the challenges, some of the tricky bits, and now the ha happier moments. We're looking at the positives and the hopes. I'd like to finish with a round of questions that with our rose tinted specs on. So how successful and sustainable approaches to light and lighting mean we can have it all. We can have aesthetics, affordability, performance, energy efficiency, carbon saving, and health and well-being all, all at the same time, all the above. So, Diana, how can interior design embrace the benefits of light and lighting to make us feel better, literally? Feel good stuff. Well, good lighting, as we've already agreed, is vital to all interior settings, and it's essential element that impacts people's physical and well, mental well-being. So good light should include, as, as John just said, natural and artificial light in order to keep and maintain happy and healthy users. So if you enter an environment with friendly, inviting light, you instantly feel at ease. Enter that environment with ins insufficient or harsh light and your mood completely changes. Lighting is a biological and physical effect that can impact on your health and well-being. 
As we've heard today, lighting can help stabilize your circadian rhythm, help improve your overall mood, contribute to better sleep, good, good lighting can help reduce depression, mm -hmm. increase cognitive performance and such as reaction time. So when designing an interior, as an interior designer, I um, bring in a lighting designer uh, because I'm not an expert on light. What I do know as an interior designer is what I want the effect to be. So I'll know that I want some feature lights of a certain look. I'll know um, what levels of lighting I want in different rooms, but I won't necessarily know how to absolutely achieve the right looks levels. So I'll bring in a lighting designer. And I think that's the key to a smooth running project and a successful lighting to scheme and I think that's the way forward for interior design across the board. So lighting then can be used artfully combining down lighters, up lighters, wall lights, floor lights, hidden lights, feature lights, integrated architectural lights, pendants and lamps that can add interest and depth to a room. Decorative lighting such as pendants or feature lights, especially in healthcare, help us to create a more domestic feeling rather than institutional. Mm -hmm. We're trying to avoid that institutional feel at, at, at all costs. So lighting is becoming one of the most important elements of design. Space designed around natural light, or it could be smart lighting systems that match our, nat our natural rhythm. Obviously, colour has a strong impact on mood and the rooms, and it makes us feel and how it makes it feel. Colour is very much affected by light, so blue in the daylight might look very different to blue in a yellowing light. So as designers, we have to also think of colour when we're combining with light. So this is where working in conjunction and collaborating with a lighting designer works because they can advise us on this. There are now many different products at our disposal as designers, such as circadian rhythm, biodynamic lighting, and then things like the, the sky ceilings that um, copy a sky. So for example, I've used sky ceiling in internal areas with no natural daylight, and it doesn't just add lighting, it gives us that connection to nature and daylight, which Jim just mentioned, biophilic design, and it, you know, which has got established benefits for mind and body. So we've like moved forward and there's this more, more things that we can use in the box and bring out to solve problems perhaps in an area where we haven't got any natural daylight you know so there's I think there's lots more available as designers to us now because lighting can definitely affect our health and well-being you only have to think about walking into a room flooded with daylight in comparison to walking into a room with a little tiny window Evidence-based design research is ongoing and new advice has been reported regularly which Jonathan mentioned earlier which can only lead to an improvement in the way we design to promote health and well-being. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Diana. And so, John, looking looking forward, all things positive. How can we rediscover the value of light? Which is kind of what Jonathan touched on earlier, earlier. So, how can we rediscover the value of light and climate-based building design? How does that happen? Uh, well, it happens really through legislation, and that's more well and standards. So the new European standard was actually quite a radical shift from everything that existed before, including British Standard 8206, which it superseded, because this, uh, this European standard just got in before the, the Brexit door came down. Um, so I, I led the changes on that, and the, the, the big shift was to go from this percentage values of an overcast sky outside to absolute values of lux, provision of absolute values. Now that allows you to start building that bridge to all of the science of photobiology and circadian entrainment because all of the stuff on, on health and well-being and illumination relates to absolute levels of light received at, at the eye, not percentages of an overcast sky. So I think now that that's, that's there in the standards, and you know, there was quite a lot of reluctance in some parts, and it did cause a little bit of agitation here. Um, but there it is now. And I think you know, a lot of people in the industry will, will welcome this challenge that they need to skill up, certainly with learning simulation tools and understanding the metrics, because it's not just about provision, it's about control as well. You know, overheating of buildings is a real risk so if you just design for daylight and don't account for the, the risk of too much sunlight, you know, you're getting into dangerous territory there. But I think now with this, this, this is starting to happen now that I think it, you have to do it. 
it's not just for schools and it's not just for high-end buildings like the New York Times. It's going to become an everyday consideration. It's become the new normal. Excellent. I think so. And um, you actually anticipate a question we've had on Twitter as well. I'll come back to you uh, hopefully in the Q&A with that. And meantime, pop your questions in the Q&A box, please, audience as well, if you can. So finally, before that Q&A, Jonathan, focusing on health and well-being, how can creative lighting solutions deliver custom environments for work and play? The custom bit is key here. Custom bit. I think... Um... I'm glad you included the word play. I quite like the word play. I think it's <laughs> something that we sort of forget sometimes as grown-ups. Um, light is, you know, how we read. It's probably one of our main senses on how we read spaces. Um, and there's a huge interplay between what the brain and the eye, or the eye sees and what the brain interprets. There's a really good book. Um, I, I got it here just so I could remember the title <laughs> of it, Incognito, um, by David Eagleman. And he talks about um, how... You know, obviously the eye sees so much out there um, and it tells the brain and the brain obviously has to discount much of what the eye sees because it can't really just take in all of that information. So what it starts doing is it just starts interpreting. So it's seen a brick wall, it knows it's a brick wall, it just decides it, that's a brick wall. What that means is, is that as he puts it, you know, actually the difference between our hallucinations in dreams and our hallucinations in, in daytime can be uh can be only uh, the only difference is the eye sort of anchors reality just slightly so in other words much of what we see is based on the interpretation of the brain based on our previous experience or a yeah. light history or you know some other things so take you know whenever you walk into a hospital it's always a great example if the lighting or the interiors and everything is very utilitarian we see that we know what it is we've seen that before you know our light history our experience of that our brain's understanding of that tells us what that space is all about and it doesn't put us at ease it doesn't put us at ease it doesn't create spaces that are you know nice creative make us feel comfortable and actually we can use that we can use that power the power of light you know to, to really design spaces if we design for people we design for their age you know it's really important as diana was saying people re perceive things differently based on their age their light history their perception uh, their geography as well mm -hmm. you know we can design spaces so it, it comes back to that point about custom you know it's not about designing you know off the book there's one one size fits all we have to design for people um light and it's also not about just creating things that in you know that, that enhance our circadian rhythm because they'll just be horrible you know that could be potentially a horrible space we want to be, create spaces that people really want to interact with um and light has the power to enrich our lives and, and it shouldn't be just that good quality light is i think john made this point earlier you know that that good quality light is just for five-star hotels or for mm -hmm. penthouses or anything like that it's something that gets into our schools and our hospitals and can make a real difference to life in people. Um, we're in the age of play now, you know, we are in the age of play. There's sort of like with some, even adults play computer games now. Um, retail needs to find a way of reinventing itself. What better way than using light into, you know, interaction and fun. Um, and a reason to be cheerful, just see, I mentioned it before, but um, you know, people are really engaged in this now. And the pandemic i hate the new normal and all of that but we it's empowered lots of people to be quite selective and considerate about the spaces they actually interact with you know they have now thought actually do you know what i might need a bit more outdoor space i might need a window i might need you know where i work is important to me because i've not been able to get outside i think you know if i take our home offices which some of us many of us have been fortunate enough to work from we've cobbled them together you know, like a bit of desk here or a table there or, a, you know, I've got a angle poise here. But most of my none of my lighting is office lighting, but I love it. And it's mine. Um, it's not bland. It's not uniform. It's not high energy. And so actually a real reason to be cheerful. I'm going on a bit. I'm sorry. But some of the drivers for ecology and well-being and good aesthetics are actually all mutually inclusive. You know, if we. We can design spaces that are both good for people that they love being in and are low energy and are well are good for well-being so there's lots to be excited about excellent very uplifting thank you and i see a little note in the chat 
Jonathan, could you please give me the full reference for the, would you mind holding the book up again, just so uh, <laughs> AC can see it's uh, Daniel Egerman, is it Incognito? Great. So there there's you go. loads of books out there, but there's just one that grabbed me. There you go, AC. It. So hopefully that's uh, helped you make a note of the title there. So, right. Uh, thank you very much. So we're moving through to the live Q&A. We've got some of the Q&A, some on Twitter. Keep them coming. You pose them. I'll ask them. John, Jonathan and Diana will answer them. So if we take first, uh, there's one here from Tom Brassel in the Q&A. And um, I think that might be for Diana, at least to begin with. How does color texture and lighting affect the visual perception for memory care design? So maybe uh, Diana, you'd like to respond first to that one, please. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, it, it, it definitely does affect memory care in good ways and in bad ways, depending if the, the lighting and color is good. So, um, for example, um, there's quite a lot of research being done on whether colour helps memory, for example, if you were in a care home and you had different floors in different colours, which we often used to do and, and still do because not everybody's got memory problems, not everybody's got dementia, so it's helpful for lots of people, but it's been shown that it's not always helpful for people with dementia. So perhaps instead of using different colours um, on different floors, it might be more about actual sort of artwork, so you might know that you live on the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the floor that's trees, or you might know that you live on the animal floor that's artwork mm -hmm. of animals or something, you know, that, that, that helps you, um, you know, um, recognize where you are so I mean but I, we still use color on different floors because it helps even the staff you know it, it's, it's it's about everybody in memory care um, and textures I, I think people forget how important and I think I'm glad you, Tom you brought it up because I think texture people forget just how important textural contrast is you know um a room can look really unbalanced you could have the lighting right you could have the colors right but if your texture's not balanced as well the room looks wrong and people can't tell why so textures is really important but it's also very help helpful for people to remember things by but where memory care where lighting can be bad um and not be unhelpful to, to memory care is if, if we imagine, and I see this quite a lot in, in care homes that need refurbishing, you'll go down a corridor where they've got not enough lighting, but very bright. So it'd be bright and then a big space and bright. So on the floor, you get mm. almost like a really bright sort of glare, then a dark part and then another bright part. Well, to somebody with me memory problems, that could create, you know, they don't actually know that the floor's flat anymore or you know it can cause all sorts of problems so i think you know lighting really comes into into how we design did that answer the i think that yeah very, very much thank you yeah and thanks for the question there tom and i had one um actually john i did say i had one that's coming via twitter for you because you did well not for you but um it applies to what you're saying earlier it says Will overheating concerns, uh, especially in respect of planning, I guess they mean, lead to smaller and fewer windows? And what will that mean for designing for daylight? Is overheating the problem? Uh, well, over overheating is a concern for sure, um, especially in highly glazed apartment buildings. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we have to look at the market here. The, in the Future Homes Commission, I think in 2013, the, the single thing that came out um, as the, the most significant preference for the British house buying public was lots of natural light. And windows were getting smaller for reasons, not, not just overheating, but actually some of the energy directives. Some people thought the easiest thing, maybe just have smaller windows because they're always the weak link. Yeah, they're either going to let in heat and they're going to lose heat, but that's not what people want. So a lot of people actually buy, you know, sort of Victorian homes, which are not that great on the energy front. And big part of that is is actual the, the light and air inside them, which some modern homes, you know, not delivering. So, yes, we do need to be concerned about overheating. But I think we're in danger of creating homes that people don't want to buy if the windows are too small. I think Jonathan likes yeah, that. I was just going to add to that, John, and it's a really good point in homes, but it, I think it also, it's a potential risk, and I don't want to be um, in the in the zero carbon conversation, you know, obviously net zero carbon is big on everyone's agenda and quite, quite rightly so, um, and obviously within that, there's a there's a desire to sort of reduce glazing because it's seen as energy inefficient, mm -hmm. um, 
and I think that how that works in homes and that works in offices and I think we really need to be cautious of that to make sure that the balance is correct um, because daylight is so important and because also you know, you know it, for all of the inefficiency that it may it may provide you know there's nothing as inefficient as a home that people don't want to move into or an office that people don't want to work in um, so we need to make that balance um, and not to be one to say you know let's just keep you know not take it seriously of course we have to take the uh, the, the climate seriously but um, just a balance that needs to be struck on that one yeah good point and i think we have a question here perhaps while you if I stay on you there jonathan is from so not coming anonymously but they're asking how can lights be combined with sensors and automation to control and optimize light throughout the day now i know we touched on it a little bit but i wonder if you could just say a little bit more about the other stuff the sensors the automation and um the, the potential there i think so that i'm sure john will have a view on this as well because i think he's his point about uh, controlling internal daylight and sunlight is really a good conversation on terms of sensors and control mm -hmm. i think um i mean i think it's i'm in between if i'm honest because <laughs> there's part of me that thinks that you could do so much with a with a space to to automate and, and, and control things, you know, certainly in terms of um, energy reduction, I think that's very useful. If you can switch stuff off with sensors, you know, let's say a, a, daylight, as a daylight sensor allows you to dim or switch off lighting, I think it's really good. We've got to get much better at being able to uh, commission these things quickly and efficiently, because if they don't happen, you never, it never gets commissioned. And that's been happening for the last 10 years. I also think that that, that there's a romantic side to me that sort of still feels that actually this big automated office is, is or off or home or anything like that loses some of that that lovely point where you build your own space i do think that you know if you take i could we could build a big office floor play and it all dims and it all controls and it's all lovely but it's still embedded energy whereas actually if you took it all the way back to a base illuminance level and just gave everyone a desk light um they would have their own ability to control. So it, it, it's, it's, it's sort of, I know I'm going to be an old Luddite and flying against the technology to some extent. It, you know, it will be horses for courses. It will be what people want. Um, some of these sensors will give us a great understanding of behavior and how we use space um, and how we can monitor space and use and everything like that. And I think that will lead to energy savings. But we also shouldn't forget that, that sort of side of, taking it down to the desk level to the to the home level to the to the reading lamp at home so that you're not you know you, you've still got control of your own space and john so perhaps if i could bring you in you know and especially in a in a world of smart everything we've got smart controls for everything how can we not be more clever with well, light uh, well i certainly second uh, everything jonathan said um you really need to give people some autonomy with what they do that's, that's absolutely vital because if you've got automated systems that don't allow for any override, then, then people will often <laughs> disable them some way or another or some, find some way of, of uh, interfering with them. Um, once you have an automated system, it's a good thing to then actually look at the, how often the overrides are engaged. Because maybe you don't want to sort of you know, get rid of them altogether, but if they're being engaged a lot very often, then there might not be you know, something too, too well, too right with your initial assumptions regarding the control. So look at that for sure. And um, yeah, uh, perhaps some you know, suggestion box on the wall from your employees <laughs> as to what they like, what they don't like. Again, don't make it too easy for them to make suggestions because then they'll just... <laughs> <laughs> just go mad. Yeah. Oh, so, sorry, I was just going to, because that's a really good point, isn't it? So actually, maybe the benefit of sensors and automation will be that it really empowers people to create their own space, you know, and, and it gives them that ability. And, it, it, you know, I guess if in a world in the future, you, you can have a system that knows what your lighting settings are, you know, so you go into a hotel room and it, it tells you what you like. It goes to that then i think that that that's a fu great future benefit and if it can save energy too at the same time and create spaces that are nicer then yeah um, maybe, good point and maybe dan if i could bring you in because obviously perhaps in some of the environments in which you work in healthcare that there's a there's a danger that thought you should be able to prescribe 
literally like, as you would a medical prescription you can prescribe the light that's best for all the residents and that's obviously impersonal and depersonalizing in terms of their space so how would you respond to the balance between um, independence and autonomy and obviously a degree of efficiency and um, a provision uh, for people who can't choose to be honest, this is a really big subject for 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 um, you know care either in the community or in care homes. Um, weirdly, I was having this conversation with somebody yesterday about some new technology. It wasn't lighting, but it's also it's about we can't lose sight that we give people choice, and you know just because somebody's got dementia or got and you know some sort of mental health issues doesn't take away their choice, and we should not be making decisions, you know, for people. Um, but we can enable people by giving them things that as, as, as Jonathan said perhaps it's you know a technology that enables them to, to change the lighting much more easier than if they were just switching there's an either on or off so that you're actually letting the resident um you know because we you know we accept that with age and I and with dementia and things people need a lot higher lighting level to be able to see and I know as I'm getting older I quite often I'm in a shop and I'm trying to read a label and I have to go near a window or I need to go and find a light to actually be physically be able to read it so I think by giving people people that option to be able to you know have say their room or their area set to what suits them right. could be enabling but I don't think it should be forced on anybody so it shouldn't be somebody else prescribing it you need 350 looks in your bedroom in the day and at night you need a, a, a blue light this you know whatever I think I think it's got we can't take away you know human choice really I think that's a really important thing for everybody if, if I could also, sorry, Jim, I know it might be going mm -hmm. off slightly, but I think there's a whole world as well where, where automation and sensors could be very useful. And it's probably on the exterior environment. Um, we, we're perhaps not talking about that at the moment, mm -hmm. but, I, you know, we know that there's great impacts on, of light on, on, on flora and fauna, you know, not just mm -hmm. humans, mm -hmm. but equally light spilling in through people's curtains and not sleeping in the dark and things like that. And actually being you know it seems like it seems so obvious but actually having something that can switch off the exterior environment build a better world for us all you know still still maintaining safety and everything but those sorts of sensors could be really you know vital to modern 24-hour yeah. cities but still you know and and we talk about biophilia as, as being you know connections to to greenery and to to the sky but we've i sometimes think we forget that biophilia could also be connections to our stars as well so um we need to make sure we don't lose that. Absolutely. I think actually in yesterday's discussion, Dave Fairbrother was talking about effectively light pollution, which obviously in rural areas can mean simply, you know, the streetlights being switched off when there are no vehicles. You know, you can have that scenario. But again, in um, in cities and uh, there, uh, there's also spill into uh, indoor environments, as you mentioned, as well as just um, the, the benefits to the uh, natural environment or our perception of the natural environment. And I've got a question here now, perhaps for all of you, maybe this has come in via uh, LinkedIn. It asks, um, has the experience of lockdown on mental health, says, changed the way people view indoor environments, not least light and lighting? So I wonder if, if you take that broadly in a post-lockdown, post-COVID, are we going to value these spaces and our ability to inhabit them for longer periods of time? And is that therefore necessarily going to mean we start thinking more deeply about the light and the lighting? John? Well, uh, I've got better daylight here at home in my impromptu home office than I actually have in my office at work. So I think well, once people start going back into their offices and they'll take that, that experience, this long-term experience of, of working from home. Now, if, if they've actually got a better luminous environment at home than they do in their office, they're going to arrive with, um, you know, with some ideas and some questions about you know, what can be done <laughs> about this. I think it's, I was just, I, I think that's absolutely right. My home office environment's good. I'm very fortunate. And that has given me a sense of, uh, I really have appreciated having outdoor space. Um, and on that basis, I'm very lucky. And I think, I guess, people's experience of this pandemic will be mixed on that front. Um, sure. And so people that have not had that access um, 
to, you know, have, uh, you, we'll be, you know, so I guess what I'm saying is, is everyone will be assessing when they return to buildings, how they view the light, be, be it they've, their home office is brilliant and they love it like you, John, or they've really struggled and they can't wait to get into a space, but it's still, you know, they know the importance of these things. Yeah, I'm not actually in my home office today, but when I'm in my home office, I've got lots and lots of natural daylight and it's absolutely lovely. I mean, for an interior designer, it's obviously crucial because mm -hmm. uh, we need to be able to see colour very clearly and everything else. But um, I think if, if we look at care homes and we say about improving lighting and stuff, I think they are probably the places where people have been locked in more than any of the rest of us. And, you know, been unable to see relatives and residents um, you know, and, and even groups between different floors haven't been able to mix. And I think it's become apparent there how important outdoor space is, you know, because that's where people have been meeting their relatives. Also, you know, some care homes, especially the old care homes, sometimes have whole floors, haven't got any outdoor space. So they mightn't even have balconies, you know, and it's become apparent you really do need, because if you're stuck on the second floor and you haven't got any balconies, what happens? Do you just stay indoors forever? You know, it's, you know, especially in a pandemic. So I think people are, are, are accepting because, you know, we all know that we need vitamin D. I mean, elderly people don't get enough vitamin D and that causes an awful lot of problems with sleep and everything. So I think, I think it's become apparent to people as well in, 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 the, in the field I work, how important it is to be able to still give people that ability to get outside for light, not just in, internal light you know it's um i think that's become very apparent and that's probably the sector that's been most badly hit by being really locked in you know at, yeah at absolutely and, yeah. and do you think i mean as you say we're all we have most people become more conscious of being great to get out in the daylight get some mm -hmm. sunshine get a bit you know and the quality of light at home and as you say some people are more or less fortunate than others but do you think then when especially if they're friends and family of people in care homes when they visit them are they going to see those spaces different and be more critical and actually demand do you think those visiting their relatives or friends will demand better quality of light and access to light having understood personally how grim it is if you're stuck in a yeah poor light if you're uh, you know uh, yeah if your light's poor? Possibly. I mean, most new build care homes, lighting is very good. You know, they've got good levels. People understand the levels and um, they're usually good levels of lighting. Um, some of the old ones that need refurbishing, I think definitely that's the case. But it's also things like, um, in, and, and this isn't done out of cruelty, this is done out of mm -hmm. You know people not understanding sometimes but you can you can go into an older care home that needs refurbishment and i've been into bedrooms where people are bedridden so say it's a nursing home and they've got a lamp shade on a lamp with a burr bulb no diffuser and that's actually a form of chinese torture it's not nice is it so i think a lot of it is people aren't doing it out of any form of you know it's just that people don't always understand. But I think when you look at newer care homes and places have been refurbished, people, you know, there's far more understanding now than there were, say, 10 years ago. And, and, we, and there's a lot more availability of different types of lights, diffused light, you know, and, and we're all just much more aware. But I agree, I think relatives could go in and then, you know, into a room and see burb light bulbs and think, this isn't right. I wouldn't put up with this at home, you know. Exactly. And then I think we're, we're coming to the end now. And I have one more question. Maybe Jonathan, um, thinking about commercial clients, maybe like to, Nana Sheldon's asked, uh, will employers change their culture now? We have learned we can be more flexible. And I wonder if you take that from the point of view that obviously we're talking about back to work. It's like whether you have to go into the office at all or how much you have to go in. But maybe if we take that to mean what kind of office are you going into? As you say, if you've had maybe a better experience in the environment at home, do you think they're going to be more receptive to giving you what you want in the office? If they want you in there, are they going to customise? Are they going to listen to you as an employee and uh, try and make the office more like home in a good way? Um, it's a very difficult one because I don't want to speak for any companies 
uh, you know, but uh, I would imagine I would be, um, <laughs> yeah, exactly, time outdoors. Um, I would, I would imagine most companies are saying, look, this is, this is going to be a cultural shift now. I, I would be surprised. Um, it could happen. It could easily happen. I think we're going to be in that sort of in between zone where we start learning and beta testing offices and working out how people actually want to use them anymore. But I think that I would be surprised if if they didn't see that there were benefits to having a more hybrid solution and using the office as a place of reinforcing company culture. And to do that, you know, and to do that, they need to think about how they how that business how that how that office looks you know and for for people that love being at home and working from home they might have to start making the office as john was sort of saying you know somewhere that you you, you know you need a reason to go into why am i going to get off of my chair i can do all the work here i can why should i go into the office well maybe it's because it's a really nice space to be in the flip side to that as well is our companies going to start looking at supporting people's home offices in terms of furniture and, and light and all sorts of things because they know that if they can get them a good home office as well as a good uh, 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 central office let's say you know um, they could get happier staff I think it, 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 I would be I would be amazed if sorry John I would be amazed if a company one company just stood there and said no everyone back in full time I think that that would be a very difficult message for people to take. Thank you. And I see actually, Nina, because uh, I interpreted the question, not 100% correctly, it appears, has added also giving you time to get outdoors, especially in winter. So I guess that's, you know, not just giving you better lighting and light in the office, but giving you the chance to actually get out in the sunlight, daylight and the fresh air and everything that goes with it. So um, thank you, Naina, for uh, uh, improving my asking of that question after the event. <laughs> thank you. So um, that's, uh, we are just about out of time now. So a big thank you to all our panelists, uh, John, Jonathan, and Diana, also to yourselves out there in Zoom land and on Twitter and LinkedIn. Thanks for your comments and questions. Uh, I should close with reminders to check out Elemental, elementalexpo.com, the online community for professionals focused on innovation in heat, water, air, and energy, vital elements within the built environment now and in the future. You will find the full diary of events on the website, as I mentioned at the top of the show, back catalog of recent sessions, including very shortly, yesterday's lighting part one on energy and carbon, loads of related themes there as well, available to watch on demand free. So thank you once again to the panel. That's been it for today. I'm Jim McClelland, editor at Susmeme. Thanks for watching and we'll see you all again soon. Thank you very much.